My name is John Amidon and I'm from Albany, New York and uh, with Veterans for Peace. However, I'm not going to start. I'm going to hand this to, give it to oh, Andy. Okay. Mm -hmm. Andy is going to start. Good afternoon. My name is Andy Shirky. I'm with Veterans for Peace, Chapter 54 over in Vermont, Green Mountain State. The focus of this session is um, basically to address a question. Yes, sir. To address, to address a question, the veteran's response to, quote, but drones save lives, unquote. The duh answer obviously is, whose lives are we talking about? Hmm? The statistics are getting to be common knowledge. The Institute for Bureau of Investigative Journalism out of the United Kingdom provides a reasonably credible listing of the people that have been killed by U.S. drones. Um, total U.S. drone strikes in Pakistan, for example, 368. Drone strikes in Yemen, 44 to 54. And it begins to identify the people that have been killed, purportedly killed. I think, this, for me, the striking figures, civilians reported killed, Pakistan, 411, 884. Children reported killed, 168, 197. So who's getting killed? People in Pakistan, Yemen, Somalia. We can't forget about the people that have been killed in this country, can we? That's the reason why we're using drones. The counterterrorism strategy is primal, but simple. Find Al-Qaeda and kill them. Who's an Al-Qaeda? It's whoever is on President Obama's list. People that get killed standing beside one of those alleged terrorists is collateral damage, whether they are children, whether they are civilians, whoever they are. So the answer to the question, but drones keep from getting us killed. They prevent killing, yeah. But what are we experiencing? It's called blowback. The recent tragedy in Boston, a prime example of that. The surviving terrorist, perpetrator, call him what you will, has stated that they were act activated in response to the killing that the United States of America has been doing in the Middle East. And let's be clear, it goes back to almost 1998 when a guy named Osama bin Laden called a jihad against Americans for three reasons. Number one, the United States was supporting Palestine, Israel in its, in its oppression of the Palestinians. Number two, the United States was maintaining military bases on the Holy Land of Saudi Arabia. And number three, the United States, the United States is responsible for the killing of one half million. One half million Iraqi children as attested by the, World Health, by the World Health Organization. Those are facts. Osama bin Laden chose to attack the United States, as we all know. The first one happened in 1998, tried to take down the World Trade Center by lighting off a couple of bombs in the basement. That didn't work, so in 2001, his followers flew the airplanes into the World Trade Center. These were not ignorant, stupid, Muslim tribesmen, whatever our government want to call them. These were educated people. They were the elite of their countries, and they took that action. The United States response was quick, powerful, but it's blowback. We're beginning to face blowback. I'll continue with that a little bit later. I'll turn it over to Don Abaddon. Hi, my name is John Amadon, as I said earlier. I'm from Albany, New York. And the question, um, again, is, do drones save American soldiers' lives? And there are a variety of way, different ways of looking at it, of course. That's why we're having this discussion. But first of all, I mean, most of the wars we in, we have, to, we have to start with the question, should American soldiers be there in the first place? And as we find out, as we go along from the war in Vietnam to the war in Iraq to um, Afghanistan, uh, in most cases the answer is no. No, we should be utilizing the world court 
and pol police systems and not invading other nations to avenge attacks on us ev uh, which were perpetrated in the case of Osama bin Laden and and a group of international terrorists we we know they were rogue actually rogue CIA uh, trained by the CIA funded and then at some point turning against us so in consideration of the war in uh, the Pakistan and we don't call it a war in Pakistan but uh, if you're on the receiving end you would certainly perceive it as a war there is no consideration by US foreign policy for deaths of civilians none that is discernible we don't actually care about the civilians population who is killed in Pakistan they don't they just don't think about it and what happens and which is verifiable is, is that we create many new terrorists by the killing of innocent civilians so we create many more enemies uh, we in effect become our own worst recruiting tool for the opposition and the net effect is is that more and more soldiers are, are then exposed to dangers uh, we also have cases of blowback where the people we are actually training such as the Afghani police force at various times individuals have turned on the American trainers the American soldiers and killed them so there is that type of blowback and when you start really doing an, uh, an in detailed analysis of the death of and who who lives and who dies I don't see any conclusive proof that any weapon system has ever saved any soldier's life and that all weapons systems are used and perpetuate war and continue to create more and more deaths in whatever army you happen to be whatever emperor you happen to be serving Elliot? Elliot Adams, Veterans for Peace. Uh, I think the issue is very simple. Um, asymmetrical warfare, fourth, fourth, fourth gener generation warfare or guerrilla warfare, whatever you call it, any other warfare which is not a battlefront warfare, we know is won and lost by winning hearts and minds. Period. There's no other answer to it. We know that drones lose hearts and minds and lose wars. On the other hand, in this world we have of perpetual war, Maybe that's a good thing. Uh, if they're trying to create perpetual, perpetual war, which I think is very clearly, clearly the case, um, then drones are effective for, for, for creating perpetual war because the more drones you set in, the more w war you wind up with. I think there are some other arguments. If you heard President Obama talking about the bombing of the Boston Marathon, he said it was cowardly. That's something people believe in. Well, the fact of the matter is drones are a cowardly way of fighting a war. Now, frankly, I don't give a damn how you fight a, fight a war. It's all wrong. We should never fight any war. They're all bad. But I think there's an argument you can use. A war is about money. Um, I have told people I was in infantry paratrooper in Vietnam, Japan, Korea, Alaska. I went out to Grenada after we attacked Grenada. I went and spent time in Gaza after Operation Castellet. I believe I do know something about war. And there are some things that are clear to me. War is not about conflict resolution. It does not resolve conflict. We know how to resolve conflict. War is not about national security. It does not create national security. We know how to create national security. And that leaves me, that leaves me saying, okay, so what is war about? Well, one thing I know about every single war I have participated in or I have studied is that a few people have made massive amount of monies or got massive amount of power. And I would argue that if that is the one consistent outcome, why do we refuse to ask whether that could not be the cause? Uh, there's a vast amount of money in, in war. War is just incredibly profitable. And throughout the history, uh, you know, all the rubber barons got to start during the Civil, during the civil War. Uh, throughout history, our, our barons have made money from war and continue to make money from, from war. And I would argue that the, re the reason they use drones is because they perpetuate war. And I want to say one other thing about the ineffectiveness of drones. 
If you aren't trying to win hearts and minds and you're trying to occupy territory, you can't occupy territory with, a, with, with drones. If you're trying to get resources, you can't get resources with drones. If whatever you're trying to do with a land warfare, you can't do with drones. So um, they're a totally ineffective weapon. Uh, I think they create more enemies than they eliminate, um, but they are effective for, for creating perpetual war. And we have, uh, we're just given like a three minute rift to start with. Well, I think I'll tag on to what John was saying about uh, these drones creating more, uh, more enemies for us. I mean, as, as he mentioned, more Afghan soldier, or more Americans have been killed by Afghan soldiers who've turned their weapons on American soldiers that were the trainers than the Taliban killed or Al-Qaeda killed last year in Afghanistan. And if you look at the composition of the Afghan military right now, uh, most of the, the people that are in that military are coming from the tribal areas along the Pakistani border. And the Pakistani border, Afghan border, is a very fluid border. And the, the people who, they're all part of the same family. And so we're killing their families. Those young men are joining the Afghan military, usually at the behest of one of the warlords who will be taking power probably by 2015. We're already seeing they're turning the weapons on Americans. We know that the CIA double agent that killed eight of the CIA, the senior Al-Qaeda watchers for the United States government that were in Afghanistan, uh, were blown up by a double agent, a Jordanian doctor who the CIA had recruited, and he blew himself up and them too, and he left a letter with his wife back in Jordan saying, I'm doing this because of those drones, those drones that are killing people in Pakistan and Afghanistan. And if you think about the, the um, Times Square two years ago where a Pakistani-American uh, almost blew up part of Times Square because he drove his station wagon filled with explosives in and parked it. And if it hadn't been for a vigilant hot dog salesman who spotted a car that wasn't supposed to be there and the police came over and saw it and got it out of there, part of Times Square would have been blown up. And that young Pakistani-American said it's because of the drones. We were in Pakistan with a delegation in September and October. 32 of us went, Code Pink Women for Peace organized it. And many people from the upstate drone coalition were on that, that delegation. And we met with uh, families of Pakistanis whose, whose family members have been killed. Uh, Kathy Kelly has met with family members of those killed in Afghanistan. Uh, we're going to be taking a delegation into Yemen to talk with the families of people who've been killed in Yemen. We know, we know that the blowback toward the United States by people who despise and hate us, and it's not for our beliefs, as our former president said, it's because what we do to them, what we do to them, that we kill them with impunity, and we, th not we, the U.S. government thinks the U.S. government can get away with anything, and we're seeing very easily that it doesn't, and our job is to try up for our own national security is to prevent the use of these weapon systems that are, that are having this, this effect. And as Elliot says, that the main thing is that we are in perpetual state of war, and until that ends, the United States will be a target for many people of the world. Thank you. So actually, I think we might do, do a poll one option is we could have a, a conversation amongst ourselves that you can listen into, or the other is we can start entertaining questions. Um, which way would you guys like to go? Questions. questions. Yeah, go ahead. Please. Please, go ahead. Yeah. Jim. Jim. Well, let, me ha let me have you have the microphone because people want to be able to hear what your okay. question is. Uh, <coughs> Uh, we've uh, we've we've talked about war here, and uh, it's it's uh, it's a, a well-known phrase that the first casualty in war is the truth. <clears throat> and uh, with I I got in here too late to see this is Andy. Uh, what I heard you mentioning uh, that the that the uh, terrorists that were alleged to have. Uh, uh, perpetrated the so nine. Need a little higher volume, and can you get to your question? Nine, nine eleven attack <coughs> were uh, 
uh, were the most intelligent in their well the the question is uh, you know coming from this uh, this issue of the first casualty of war is the truth is that the truth uh, apparently is still uh, not established uh, I don't know what it is but I know that that those researchers independent researchers who have have uh, <coughs> studied the, the the collapse of those buildings have found evidence that that conflicts with the official account and I think that it's incumbent upon us to to make ourselves aware of those observations of these people uh, architects and engineers for 9-11 truth and dr. David Ray Griffin and his books and uh, to really uh, uh, analyze this thing and to try to establish the truth so okay I'm not sure there's a question in there. Uh, do we have another question? Come on, come, come, come on up as, as you need as you need be, so we can hear you. Well, yeah. well, You'd like to address that? Yeah, I, I, I would okay. like to acknowledge what you're saying. I would like to acknowledge what you're saying. I I totally agree with you. I think we do not have the American public has not been given any sort of the real answer to what happened on 9-11 and that pitiful little congressional inquiry onto it is uh, is a joke done by the Bush administration um, so I think it is very important for us to be uh, any way we can to keep poking at it and poking at it until finally the truth emerges thank you thanks Jim. Hi, um, I'm Sally Jones from Staten Island. I wanted to ask you, uh, in talking with other veterans from the uh, non-anti-war groups, like the Veterans for Foreign Wars or the um, other, the Vietnam Afghanistan Veteran Association, all these other veterans groups, um, is there a way to start a dialogue with them about the drones? Um, just uh, could is because at one point I saw that the it, seventy percent of Americans uh, were supportive of drones because it's going to save Americans lives the soldiers lives you know honestly I at times I've uh, tried to establish different dialogues with veterans in my community. Uh, in fact, I'm invited to speak at a conference um, which is primarily veterans who support war, but the name of the conference is when Johnny comes marching home and gets arrested. <laughs> and I qualify on, on two accounts. I've been arrested a, a few times and my first name is John, you know, so there you go. And I, I called them up and I asked them, do you really want me to come, you know, um, do you know who I am? And I, they said, yes, we, we do actually want you to come. We, we want to hear the other side. So it'll be an interesting experience and I'll tell you how, you know, that, that particular piece of dialogue goes in the future. Um, I haven't, personally, I haven't really found effective ways of addressing the issue. Of, I mean, some of it becomes a mantra. It's like, I, you know, it saves American lives. So we heard that from Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Nothing is farther from the truth. You know, it, we didn't need to drop the bombs. We didn't need to invade the island. That's well established. Uh, it might have saved a few lives. You know, I mean, it, it's certainly possible that a few people weren't killed. Um, but it's also equally possible that so many more Americans have been killed because we believe that lie and we uh, then think something can be actually accomplished with war. They say that the person to be most afraid of is the person or the country that wins the war because they actually end up believing they can accomplish things with violence. So when we look at the history of atomic testing we see that there were many atmospheric tests and that radioactive clouds and radioactive rain fell on New York from Nevada and that we developed thyroid cancer here. We look at all the downwinders in Utah, in um, Iowa, Colorado and see the 
the deaths of so many Americans with the weapons that are supposedly saving our lives. But we don't do the actual accounting. And we don't actually do the accounting for drones save, you know, pilots' lives compared to what? Compared to when? And in the future, when the opposition has drones and we're fighting back and forth with fully automated war, how are we going to account for that? It, but in, in establishing the dialogue, which is very important, the best we can do is, is try to attempt to have these honest dialogues with each other and, and keep trying. But for my, my results have been abysmal, to tell you the truth. I mean, there doesn't seem to be a window open. Let me just, okay. Uh, I just say that, that I don't think approaching vets is much different than approaching anybody else. Uh, you better st if you want to talk with somebody, you better start by listening. And often you have to listen for a long time. Uh, and if you start with a, if you come back with a, well, let me put it this way, I think that in an exchange, you have, right, you have an ability to control it. If somebody comes attacking you and you counterattack, they're going to continue the attack. If you take, take it a different approach, you can often change the discussion. But I think that you have to come with the idea of if you want to establish a, a, a conversation of making space so you can take time to listen and ask some questions and then lead into um, an exchange. I can give you one instance of a conversation I had with a, uh, with a Korean War vet. As many may know, the Pentagon has um, announced that they are going to be striking a new medal to award to the pilots of these drones. Uh, I can't remember what the BS title of it is, but in any event, uh, this medal will have a higher precedence than the Bronze Star, which is awarded for gallantry in battle. And the response of this one veteran was, WTF, they're gonna give a medal for this guy sitting in the bunker someplace killing people when I'm out there having my head rear end you know, shot at? That's BS. That was that veteran's reply. He was not abs he was not he was totally ignorant of the impact that what that pilot was doing when he was sitting there in that control room. He had absolutely no concept. One comment I would like to make though about getting the word out on April 21st, that was last Sunday, on the NBC program Meet the Press, Tom Brokaw was the guest. And during that time, he came out and shock shock acknowledged that America's attacks abroad increase the risk of attacks at home. To quote Tom Brokaw, to quote Tom Brokaw, we have got to look at the roots of all this because it exists across the whole Asian subcontinent and the Islamic world around the world. I think we also have to examine America's use of drones because there are a lot of civilians who are innocently killed in a drone attack in Pakistan, in Afghanistan, and in Iraq. And I can tell you, having spent a lot of time over there, Young people will come up to me on the streets and say, we love America, but if you harm one hair in the head of my sister, I will fight you forever. And there is this enormous rage against what they see in that part of the world as a presumptuous of the United States. Well-respected, venerated newsmen. You may all be familiar with what Stanley McChrystal, former head of the Joint Special Operations Command has to say. To quote General McChrystal, what scares me about drone strikes is how they are perceived around the world. The resentment created by American use of unmanned strikes is much greater than the average American appreciates. They are hated on a visceral level, even by people who have never seen one or seen the effects of one. Hmm? McChrystal conducted interviews, and Monksy, he said he's got to trust the perception of American arrogance that says, well, we can fly where we want, we can shoot where we want, because we can. Yeah, give me an opportunity to talk. <coughs> Thank you. Uh, for some time, I tried to think of my relationship to the whole drone activity. I was a bombardier. I flew 35 missions out of England. That's World War Two, not World War One. <laughs> <coughs> uh, 
Uh, oh, and you know the definition of a terrorist is a person who kills innocent people for a uh, political objective. Well, I was a terrorist. Not a retail terrorist, I was a wholesale terrorist. I killed hundreds, maybe thousands of people. And when you're a terrorist for a country, they give you medals. I got the air medal, the thing was flying across. I was a hero for killing people. When we flew, we killed lots of civilians, even when we went to military targets. You couldn't send a hundred B-17 planes to drop bombs on a target without spreading it to a large area. We killed, as a matter of fact, we firebombed certain cities. And the total objective of that was to destroy the city and the people. In Hamburg, when you flew B-17s and you dropped 500 and 1,000 pound bombs on the area, and then you send waves of B-17s dropping firebombs, which exploded in heat, set to fire anything it attached to. It set up a Fahrenheit level that sucked the oxygen out of the air and the area became a chimney. In Hamburg, we killed 50,000 people. In Dresden, you may have heard, one of the most beautiful cities, all of Germany, had no military purpose. And four months before the end of the war, we firebombed Dresden for two days killed maybe a hundred thousand people. War is a total terrorism. The reason I'm opposed to the drones is first of all I object to anything that advances military purposes for whatever it is. It's awful. It's obscene. But my moment excuse me but also, it started to make me think of how the American public will regard the drones being as antiseptic as it is to make it more acceptable to wage war. And if you raise that mentality to a higher level, why not drop a nitrogen bomb? If I was your younger I go to a more civilized country, yes. but I'm too old to go. But anyway, thank you very much. Thank you. Oh, I thought you wanted to, uh, I thought you had your hand up before. I did, I did. Uh, my name is Chuck High, and I'm also a Veterans for Peace uh, serving in the Vietnam War. Uh, you know, when these wars started up, I, uh, and, and how they transpired, it seemed like there was nothing but incompetence on the military's standpoint. And, and I'm wondering if ability to actually understand the wars that we're in and to deal with it accordingly. And so I'd like your comments a little bit about, um, you know, maybe whether the drone is actually a, a, a sign of our, our um, lack of real understanding of the world. And, and it's just motivation, the motivation for it is just corporate greed and the military is like out of the picture as far as deciding about this stuff. It's, it's almost as if, I, you know, I don't, I don't know. It's so bizarre in my mind that it, it's beyond my understanding. So I'm wondering if you could just give your uh, assessment of that in, uh, under that context anyway. I'd like to address your question. In 1956, 
I raised my right hand and I swore that I would support and defend the Constitution of the United States against all enemies, foreign and domestic. I fear for the Republic. The Constitution is under assault. The concentration of power in the executive branch is becoming more and more onerous. In 1973, Richard Nixon on the White House tapes was heard saying, if the President of the United States does it, it's not illegal. Henry Kissinger in 2009, as reported by a leak on WikiLeaks, in a conversation with the Turkish ambassador, is saying, the illegal we can do right away. Breaking the, the Constitution takes a little bit longer. That is the kind of mindset that has begun to envelop the government of this country. It is driven by money. It is driven by power. The Constitution is helpless. The presidents of this country, aided and abetted by their venal compatriots in the Congress, are selling this Constitution down the river. I must do something, whatever I can, to keep that from happening. These drone strikes, this drone approach taken by President Obama, is just one more slip down the slippery slope. It's just one more slip. Where the bottom will be, I don't know. Is it going to be the next economic collapse, which will be greater than this last one we experienced in 2008? What will be the outcome of that? Is the government going to take over, going to declare martial law? People who oppose the government, what are they going to become? Are they going to move from that file out in Utah from being a dissident to being a terrorist? What will the government do? The rule of law will no longer prevail. The Constitution, the supreme law of the land, will no longer prevail. This government has been breaking the treaties it's entered into since God knows when. 1970, the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty. Forget it. This country has no intention of giving up nuclear weapons. Just last week, the President has decided to spend $10 billion to upgrade the B-62 nuclear weapon so it can become a smart bomb. I mean, how smart can an atomic bomb be, for heaven's sakes? For two years, I practiced dropping atomic bombs. They don't get any smarter, I can tell you. What are we going to do about this rush to violence? How can it be stopped? That's the big job, I think. We, in the peace movement, we have to make people aware of where this country has been for going for quite some time. We have got to do something to stop it. Something I believe is that when we participate in violence, when we participate in killing, it dulls our conscience and it dulls our intellect. Then there's the practical application that we literally see this manifested by the ineffective and improper uses of our resources, i.e. they're being spent on war, we're no lo longer taking care of children, we're no longer providing for teachers and, and good education for our children, uh, we no longer have the health care, we no longer have quality cities. Uh, if you look around in upstate New York, Syracuse has come up a little bit, but so much of upstate New York looks like Appalachia. And, and then there's Detroit, which kind of really blows your mind when you actually see what's left of that, that city. So I, I think we've, we're kind of lost right now because we have participated in violence for a long time. You know, our whole, our whole historical timeline is war, the uh, Revolutionary War, the War of 1812, the Civil War, the American Indian War, World War I, World War II, the war in Vietnam, the Korean War, and I probably left out a few little wars in between. But when we have our children come out of our schools, they're thoroughly militarized by our historical timeline, and they're actually looking for their war. I was looking, where's my war? We could have whole different kinds of timelines for teaching. Could be based on lighting. Could be based on medical advancement. I mean, there are an infinite amount of alternatives for types of history we could teach. I also learned recently, and I'm going on a little bit, but addressing consciousness is kind of a tricky problem. How do we actually move forward in our own lives? In one of my, my recent arrests, which was an epiphany for me, quite literally, is 
I momentarily clicked off a fear file. And I want you to think of a hard drive on a computer for just a moment, most of you work, because when you delete a file, you create a space, and now you can put something else in it, and it's up to you to put whatever you want in that space. Well, if you, in your own consciousness, if you can click off your own fear file, whatever that file may be, you create a space. And what I experienced for myself was that when I clicked off this fear file, I actually experienced love flowing in. Love in a very practical sense of, I'm in this situation where I'm being dragged along by a young Air Force security person, and normally I, I would have thought I would have felt really angry or fearful, but I was actually very calm and uh, ended up calming the young man down, saying, hey, look, I'm an old guy, you know, I'm not resisting, take it easy, you know, relax. And, and that was a very practical application of love in a way that I had never experienced before. Um, so I want to suggest that we look into approaching things that we are fearful of and, and going into them to whatever degree we're possible and overcoming our own fear so that we move forward in our own understanding and clear out, you know, clear out things that are getting in our own ways. Uh, and I know it's just a little bit off topic, but, but when we, we end up with a society that's so enamored with death, when we have a president who says, oh, you guys got to rein me in because I really love these drones, you know, and they seem to work for me. Uh, but he's saying, yeah, at the same time, I mean, we have to start overcoming our own fear on larger levels. We need to do more. We need to, this is a convergent to action, we're calling this particular event. We will have an action tomorrow. So I want to invite as many of you as you, who possibly can to risk a greater action, whatever that means. If it means tomorrow you can, uh, as one gentleman, as we know we're calling it civil resistance, but if it could be called civil obedience because we're actually upholding and obeying the laws, whatever. But it doesn't have to be tomorrow, but think about it for the future also. Um, taking actions that require you to confront non-violently the people who are upholding a system of violence and death. Uh, I just want to answer, uh, Andy posed some very good questions like where do we go, how far down do we go with the system, uh, at what time does, do we quit becoming more and more militarized, and for me the answer is very, very simple. We will keep, keep militarizing until we the people say no more. We will keep going into a higher, higher concentration of wealth uh, until 90% have one half of a, of, of, of a percent or whatever it is put together. Uh, it'll keep getting worse and worse until the people say no more. Uh, and this history of this country has been absolutely clear that the power holders will keep pushing as, fa as hard and as fast as they can and it, uh, it only stops when the people rise up and say no more. The largest ROTC chapters in the country belong to Catholic uh, universities. And I'm a uh, alumnus of Niagara University and I had a couple years of uh, going back and forth with letters to the president of the college because I said it's a scandal that a university whose founder was Jesus Christ who showed the most perfect example of perfect love and non-retaliation to his murderers um, that you allow ROTC on the campus and we went back and forth with a few letters and one of them I finally said if you ever been to Niagara University they have alumni the alumni chapel and it's the administrative building and the chapel for the campus. In the basement of that is the ROTC office. And I said to him, how can you celebrate the sacrifice in the mass and celebrate God's greatest gift of love and underneath you train people to kill others and break things? And his answer to me was, we don't teach them to kill things, kill people and break things, we teach them leadership. This July is the 30th anniversary of the Seneca Women's Peace Encampment. <laughs> so we bought the land next to that um, Seneca Army Depot that was deploying crews and Pershing missiles to 
well certainly to London and probably other places in Europe and um, so let's see summer of 83 I think summer of 84 the largest population we had there with, uh, on the land that we bought women bought the land right next to that army depot and uh, summer of 84 we had 12,000 women and children camping there and um, we continued to own that land for quite a while but was it two years after we left they closed the Seneca Army Depot so there you go <laughs> you just show up yes please do set? well dear Mick uh, the reason he's not standing up here to say what he he would like for me to say and if you want to take my place at any moment is because he is deeply affected as we all are and now I'm going to start crying too <laughs> no what he was saying we've got to talk about the costs the costs to not only the people that we're killing but the ones that are doing the, the killing the cost to our young men and women and what Mick is talking about specifically are the number of suicides that we're having of our own veterans now you know over 18 a day are, are committing suicide 18 a day and Mick just mentioned he was in Vietnam for eight, five years he was a crypto linguist he listened in on the North Vietnamese what they were talking pardon North Vietnamese MiG pilots and the North Vietnamese MiG pilots and ground controllers and he said I knew them I knew them I knew that they were people I listened to them as they talked so as they, as they died as they died so he said you know I've got a lot of demons myself I mean we all do we all do and this whole issue of people that are serving you know serving the country but when the country says we go to war and we kill whoever the country wants the government wants us to in this state sponsored killing then the demons that come to so many 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 people who do that and whatever side they're on but that's human beings and we as human beings have to stop it so Mick thank you so much for reminding us of that Uh, my name is Chris Antall. I'm a Unitarian Universalist minister. Uh, also had the opportunity to serve uh, as a military chaplain in Afghanistan. I came back uh, last month. Uh, I spent 21 weeks uh, living under drones. Uh, in the course of carrying out my duties as a chaplain, I performed more than 60 religious services counseled uh, hundreds of soldiers uh, I put or helped put 18 caskets on a plane as part of uh, dignified transfer ceremonies and uh, probably 25% of those were deaths by suicide uh, so one of the realities that became uh, very evident to me was uh, what we are now calling moral injury and a moral injury has been defined well in uh, several books um, is a betrayal of what's right um, so in the context of this workshop talking about uh, the lives of soldiers and service members and to the extent that drones can can save those lives uh, I can only speak from my personal experience and the kind of moral anguish that I experienced during my 21 weeks uh, living under drones seeing them launch and land most of them unarmed but many of them armed and seeing them leave with Hellfire missiles and come back without them and wondering where they landed and who they killed and our soldiers and service members are connected to the internet and are very aware of reports that are made public and I know that even for myself I read the report from Stanford University and the New York University Law School it came out online living under drones it 
was released the month I arrived in theater. So I'm wrestling with that information and the reality of being on the ground. And that is a soul wound. Uh, and that is a moral injury. Uh, so I know as a chaplain when I came back and I was given the medical assessment at Fort Bliss and they asked, did you experience any injuries in Afghanistan? I said, yes, I, I have a moral injury. And I think that uh, it's true for many of our service members. Uh, I'm proud of my service and I'm proud of the men and women who serve. And most of the service members I've worked with joined up out of a sense of duty and motivated by values like honor and service. And when we execute our wars in a way that betrays some of the core values that we pledge to put our lives on the line for, that hurts. Uh, it hurts me and it hurts uh, uh, many of the soldiers uh, that I, I worked with. Um, so I can only speak these things as a civilian. I don't speak on behalf of the Department of Defense. Um, but uh, I share them uh, from my experience. And he has now received a general officer letter of reprimand for telling the truth. Yeah. And He, in response, wrote a, wrote a prayer. I wrote this in uh, Kandahar uh, three days before Veterans Day. And I uh, included it in my liturgy on Sunday, November 11th, uh, when I preached to my congregation uh, that, that morning. And uh, it's called a, a Veterans Day Confession for America. And in fact, it's written for all of you and us. On this Veterans Day, let us confess our sins before God and neighbor. Most merciful God, we confess we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed by what we have done and what we have left undone. We have become people of the lie, out to tame the frontier wilderness, while the beast within lurks hidden in shadow, paralyzing us in a perpetual state of denial. We have made war entertainment, enjoying box seats in the carnival of death, consuming violence, turning tragedy into games, raising our children to kill without remorse. We have morally disengaged, outsourcing our killing to the 1%, forgetting they follow our orders. The blood they shed is on our hands too. We have insulated ourselves from the painful truths veterans carry our bumper magnets proclaim support our troops, but for too many, suicide is the only panacea. Our insulation is their isolation. We have made our veterans into false idols, blood sacrifice on the national altar of war. Parades and medals perpetuate the hero myth glorifying those who kill and die on our behalf. We have betrayed the dead, saying they will never be forgotten. Yet how many among us can name a single war casualty of the past decade? We have sanitized killing and condoned extrajudicial assassinations, death by remote control. War made easy without due process, protecting ourselves from the human cost. 
we have deceived ourselves, saying Americans do not kill civilians, terrorists do, denying the colossal misery our wars inflict on the innocent, the national closet bursts with skeletons. And we have abandoned our Afghan allies, luring them in with promises of safety and security, then failing to follow through with promises made, using them and leaving them to an almost certain death. Almighty God, on this Veterans Day, help us turn from this wayward path. Deliver us from indifference, callousness, and self-deception. Fill us with compassion for all who bear the burdens of our wars. Grant us the courage to pay attention, to stay engaged, so we may listen without judgment, restore integrity, accept responsibility, keep promises, and give honor to whomever honor is due. I haven't spoken up at anything. I've been uh, holding my tongue. But I did want to propose uh, a solution that we do recognize how rotten our government is, how corrupt, how evil. And uh, the solution I'm proposing is that we begin as a people imagining a peaceful American spring in the tradition of Arab Springs in which the people do ceremoniously withdraw their consent from the current government and along with it the current economic system. And we begin now developing the alternative to switch to. We don't need the same three party, uh, what I mean, three houses, uh, two houses of Congress and all that crap. We can have a direct democracy. Everybody can uh, interact with a laptop or a tablet and we can have direct democracy. Uh, earlier, uh, Margaret Flowers and Kevin Zeese were kidding around about uh, naming an alternative cabinet. I think we should begin considering who the people should be of our new government. Online, I have a list of my favorite hundred, but you can come up with your own. Uh, one thing I haven't done yet is I haven't fleshed out a website I did purchase the name. I bought the name PeacefulRevolution.us. And what I would imagine is that people put down their complaints about the way things are, and we begin thinking as a people what it would be like after the revolution. Thanks. The contractors are the, the companies that make the drones, the Lockheed Martins, the General Atomics. There are over 500 companies in the United States alone that now make drones. And as a part of that, the, the ones that make the drones generally maintain the drones, and some of the, the companies actually fly the drones. For example, the, the drones that are being flown over Pakistan by the CIA, my understanding is that there's a huge component of contractors that are doing that that CIA government officials are not necessarily the ones that are doing the piloting or the maintenance or anything with it. They give the orders and then civilian contractors making a quarter of a million dollars a year or more are the ones that actually implement uh, the, the, uh, the decisions of the, the drones to fly, target, and kill. And in the same way for the U.S. military, and, the, and these are good questions because we don't have the full figures on all of that. But we do know that the number of contractors in Afghanistan are more than the number of U.S. military in Afghanistan. And I would suspect that a, a large component of the maintenance for, for drones and probably a lot of the analytical uh, 
things that are done. You know, each for each drone fly, it's something like 20 different intel analysts are analyzing the data uh, that's coming back from these drones. And some of it will be done by military, but there will be a lot of uh, civilians who have, have uh, U.S. government clearances that will be doing a lot of that work. So there's, where's the accountability? Isn't that the question, starting from the very top, with the President of the United States who becomes the prosecutor, judge, jury, and executioner? And really, there is no accountability at all. There is none. To my knowledge, there's not been one drone attack that's ever been formally questioned. Uh, we've, there is no accountability at all. That question about fear, I believe the uh, quotation that I'm most familiar with about that is, if you can make them afraid, you can make them do anything. That's attributable to Dr. Goebbels, Adolf Hitler's Minister of Propaganda. And I think that's right. I think what we are seeing evolving in the United States is a attempt, maybe it's benign attempt, but I think it's definitely an attempt to cultivate a sense of fear. You just need only look at the faces of the people that were caught on TV after the Boston Marathon bombing there were people that were afraid. What about the people in Pakistan? What about the people in Yemen? What about the people in Pakistan where 90% of the people hate the United States? Once they get over that fear, they get angry and they turn. They turn against us. It's going to be a tough one to go. Uh, the word I'm picking up is that the new <clears throat> head of the CIA would like to divest the drone campaign and shift it over to the Pentagon. The De Defense Intelligence Agency uh, is reportedly going to take on about 1,600 additional overseas intelligence people whose mission will be to identify potential terrorists in support of what we've already heard is called the disposition matrix. I call your attention to a three-part article put out by the Washington Post uh, last fall. The first one came out on October 23rd, and it talks about the plans, the drone campaign. It talks about how the development of this matrix is going to be a single con continually evolving database in which biographies, locations, known associates, and affiliated organizations are all cataloged. So are strategies for taking targets down, including extradition requests, capture operations, and drone patrols. That's what we're going to be faced with over these coming years. The horizon for this program is conservatively estimated to be 10 years. 10 years of ongoing terror, ongoing drone strikes, ongoing blowback, creating more and more fear, creating more and more killing.